Good morning, Don. Good morning, Jen, and uh, good morning, everybody. So uh, we're pretty excited to be here this morning with you all or the evening, wherever you are, to talk about enterprise integration with um, automations. That's a key part of um, FME server. So lots of fun. We have some great demos and um, yeah. So, and yeah, there's, so I guess there's us. Yeah, yeah. Although that photo is a little bit old now, but um that's right. There's no no chance that you're gonna get us confused if you meet us in person. <laughs> <laughs> Jen has great hair and I don't have any, so there you go. <laughs> um yeah, so I guess we should introduce ourselves a little bit in case people don't know who we are. Um yeah. so I've been at Safe for a little while now. Um I've been an FME server expert for around three and a half years before transitioning in the spring to take on support for our FME Cloud product, which is just a hosted version of FME Server in AWS. So if you ever um, use our FME Cloud or you're deploying FME Server with things like Docker or Kubernetes, and you come into support, you'll probably be speaking to me. Yeah, awesome. Yeah, and I've been um, at SAFE since the beginning. I'm one of the co-founders and I spend a lot of my time talking about and thinking about things about server and um, enterprise and of course you know xml so yep <clears throat> and, so what are we doing and today talk about XML. yeah yeah john are you going to tell us what we're talking about today sure so we'll we'll, we'll set the frame we'll set sort of the, the the sort of the context first and we'll talk about and um, enterprise um, applications and uh, integration and and what are these enterprise integration patterns and why are we so excited about them? And then we're going to you know talk about the FME platform and then we're going to give four demos showing um, FME automations, um, yeah, in action. Yeah. Yep. Yeah, so what so what would you say is an enterprise yeah. application for people who maybe don't know what we're talking about today? Yeah, yeah. so enterprise inter applications are applications that are installed, you know, at the enterprise. So, you know, so SAFE has many, we have Salesforce, we have Slack. And the one thing that everybody expects of their enterprise applications today is that we expect that the applications all communicate and they work together users don't want to have to be moving from application to application they expect if they do something in one application it's automatically um, the information that's um, necessary is moved to you know, another application so and you know that they don't want the applications to work in isolation they want them to work collectively so yeah yeah there you go exactly yep. so that's yeah so yeah. what is enterprise integration jen <laughs> so this is when you're bringing all of these different enterprise applications together and you'll probably be sharing different services, functions and data between them to allow you to achieve, I guess, what your business operations and processes need. So we have a lot of mm -hmm. customer stories actually online on our website where we have people doing this. So one of them is actually pretty local to us. So we have the city of Coquitlam. They have a few different enterprise applications, so things like Maximo, Tempest, and they also have a third party vendor for things like recycling bins. But they needed to come up with a system that made it easy to integrate all three of those together. Um, so they're using enterprise integration to do that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. So basically, uh, within an organization, um, the idea of bringing, connecting all your data, all your applications, your services, and your devices together so that information can flow freely, um, basically to get you know, more value from your IT um, investments. Nobody as a user wants to be, have to go to one application, do one thing, then, oh, that, this other system also needs the same information, so I'm gonna rekey it in over here. Um, that just drives people crazy, and there's lots of, errors that are made, people aren't great at doing the same thing uh, multiple times. And so why have your most expensive and valuable resource doing that? Why not use use enterprise integration um, to remove it and make the workflows much smoother? Yeah. yeah. And I guess the one thing you didn't mention as well is that the time savings as well. If you start to yeah. integrate these different enterprise applications together, 
like the customers that we see doing it, like the time savings that they have is so so big compared to everyone manually going and extracting all of this data. So yeah, that's great. So what are enterprise integration patterns? So a pattern by definition is just the regular way in which something happens or is done. So if we apply this to enterprise integrations, we can start to look and see if there are regular ways that different enterprise integrations are done um, across different organizations and in different industries. So uh, we've been reading this book, um, Enterprise Integration Patterns. So what this is doing is the authors of, these, of this book noticed that integrating enterprise applications wasn't easy. Um, and this was exacerbated by a lack of common language between the different departments and people that were trying to integrate these enterprise applications. So what they did was they came up with 65 patterns um, that they noticed for repeatable solutions. And they made sure to use technology independent vocabulary um, and their book and their website has a lot of diagrams in to make it easier to document these different uh, integration solutions. So what they've done here is sort of create a sort of cookbook approach to enterprise integration. So it covers common themes that people will experience and need to do when they're integrating enterprise applications. So it's not like a step-by-step -step recipe book on how to integrate every different enterprise application or system out there because that would be impossible. So they've just mm -hmm. identified them as different patterns um, that people can apply in their workflows. Yeah, yeah. So if I was an IT um, expert and I'm integrating a, um, a, bunch, a bunch of systems together, what I do now is I come in and I look for these common patterns that I'm aware of. And then with FME, um, you can solve each of these, these portions of the problem with different patterns. And then by linking the patterns together, you can come up with a repeatable solution. And um, and the thing is, is there's these patterns that happen over and over again from organization to over organization. And um, and these are something that's used in software, you know, in software architecture, just building programs. This whole idea of finding patterns really can help you um, build repeatable solutions. Um, yeah, and that's it. Yeah. So do you yeah, want to so, talk? Yeah. Okay. Yes. Yeah, so, yeah. So in FME, so you're not going to see in FME, you're not going to see. Hey, there's the splitter pattern. There's a process manager pattern. There's a content richer pattern. Um, what you're going to see is these ability to easily build these patterns. And then so what Jen and others at Safe are doing is showing examples of each of these patterns. So then you could take that pattern and use it in your own in your own solution so yeah so this is one of the more common ones this is called a splitter pattern and we're going to show this in action later and the idea is you have a message coming across and and that's how all these different systems communicate is with these um these um, things called messages and in fme under the covers we're, we're slinging json around so it, the messages are json um, and JSON is, you know, the common um, language of the web and also of web services. And so it's very easy to get to sling JSON back and forth. And so in this first pattern we're going to look at, we're showing here is called the splitter pattern. You have a, a message coming in, but it's got multiple components in it and you want to split it up into small individual messages. And, um, and that's really easy to do. It's called the splitter pattern. And the nice thing is, is the splitter pattern is all those order items, so all those um, component pieces that are split up um, can be done in parallel. And so, yeah, and we're gonna show you um, how to do that, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, so um, how are they used? Um, again, when organizations have a, a set of applications, what they do is they come in um, and now you can identify the, the, um, the problem, break it down into a set of patterns that need to be solved, implement those, um, and then to use them to solve your integration challenge. So what the first step is you go and kind of, you know, like harvest patterns. Here's the content richer pattern here. Here's the, uh, the splitter pattern there. Here's the process manager pattern here. And then now that you've broken it down into these patterns and you know how to solve each small little pattern, 
it allows you to decompose the larger problem, which might seem, you know, you know, impossible to solve into smaller and smaller little patterns that you can solve for solving bigger problems. Yeah. 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 And so for enterprise inter enterprise integration, um, it's different than Workbench. In Workbench, we're slinging rows around. We're slinging the raw data here. It, which going on between each of the components in the automations you're going to see are these messages and the messages are JSON and um, and we can connect to things like JSON uh, or JMS internally we have a high performance um, JSON architecture we allowed you to use no code and so the big difference with FME and um, automations is that you do not have to write any code so you'll see us build these patterns today and we're not going to open up any code editor there is no code to write it's all done in a visual um, environment. So, and it is the only one that has been built from the ground up to be no code. Other tools are striving to be no code or they call about low code, um, whereas FME is a no code um, solution. Yeah, safe software. So we've been doing this for uh, 25 years, working on um, enabling people to get more value from data. Um, about 10,000 plus organizations use um, FME technology to solve problems in many, many industries. Um, we have a partner network around the world that, that gives face-to-face um, -face or consulting services or value-added resellers or integration services. And um, 128 countries from been localized in English, French, Spanish, um, Mandarin, Japanese, and um, others, yeah. So our mission um, is always been to help users help you maximize the value of data and applications. And so automations really focuses on enabling you to maximize the value of connecting your applications together. For years, we've been working on enabling you to get whatever data you're working with to the applications and transform data from one data type to another data type. And now with automations, we're really taking it to the next level and enabling you to take the amazing power we have of the data engine and connecting that to the applications, connecting technology of automations to give you a full um, enterprise solution. So the FME integration platform, there's two main products really here. Um, so everybody needs to start with FME desktop. So this is where you will so author your workflows that are going to be doing the integration and including some of the patterns in there. So as Don mentioned, it's a no code interface. You can add all your connectors in there, transform your data so that you get the output that you need. And then once you're ready to start automating those workflows, you wanna take it off your desktop and publish it to FME Server or FME Cloud, which is our hosted version of FME Server in AWS. So you don't have to worry about deploying it, managing the hardware infrastructure with FME Cloud. We do that all for you. So this is where you start to really leverage all of the different automation capabilities and make your workflows, take them away from being a manual thing that you'll run every time someone maybe requests an integration to getting them to just run without you and do that quickly. Yeah, yeah. that's great. Yeah, and spatial data, um, FME sort of grew up processing spatial data in the beginning. And I think in a slide or two, Don's gonna show all the different formats that we do support. Um, but FME came from a spatial background, so we do support spatial data better than any other enterprise integration tool. And we are seeing that spatial data is becoming critical for the enterprise. So I think spatial data historically might have been considered something that maybe has a higher barrier to entry. So advanced software was needed, probably specialized people, and the data would have been really large, which meant it was difficult to process, store it, and move it around. So companies weren't using it to their full potential. So a lot of the technology advancements that we're seeing, like especially with cloud computing, have lowered that barrier. I and mean, we're seeing some really big players that were traditionally in the non-spatial arena start to add spatial support as they're realizing that it's a critical market for them. So these are people like Snowflake, Amazon Redshift, Google BigQuery, um, and we do support all of those in FME as well. Um, we're also seeing as well that spatial data, um, it's easier than ever to access spatial data and also create spatial data. 
So there's more and more satellites going up, more and more open data portals that you can download all this data. And even things like your smartphone, which is most people have a smartphone in their pocket, which has location data turned on. So you're sending that back to a lot of different applications on your phone, giving people spatial data to work with and sort of learn more about who is using their services. So then with FME, um, you can connect all of these different data types, applications and services together. Um, so inside FME Desktop, traditionally people have always started with readers and writers, which will connect two different data sources which you have on your computer. Uh, but more and more we're adding these connect to transformers. So transformers are like the building blocks to your data transformation. So these are the little blue blocks that you'll see inside any of our workspace screenshots. And each of these has a specific function. So you can connect these in different combinations to manipulate and transform your data however you need. So our connector transformers that we're adding more and more of um, are just enabling connections to different web services and systems. So we have things like CityWorks, Azure Blob Storage, Amazon S3, for example, and we're publishing these up to our FME hub. So they're not shipped and dependent on FME release cycles. You can go and download them off the FME Hub whenever you need them, which means because all of these are web-based quite often, if the API is changed, it means we can quickly get on top of those and people will always be able to connect to these different web services. And then obviously the automation piece, which we're gonna be going through in detail today with FME Server. Yeah, so this is um, really shows the, the breadth um, of our support with FME, um, of the FME platform when it comes to data types. So you can see um, everything from GIS and CAD, which is definitely spatial, to you know XML, and that's just say XML and JSON, which is the languages of the web, as well as very complex, um, some very complex data data files that we work with, to BIM, to you know point clouds, to indoor mapping. And really, when you look at um, integration tools, there's no other integration tool um, out there that supports the number of different data types of FME. So there's, you know, we, we really don't even count number of systems that we connect to anymore. It's well over 500. And with the web services, it's just exploding. So that really has that, that count really hasn't, um, doesn't make much sense anymore. So if you have a web service that has a JSON API on it, and then um, FME can um, connect to it and work with it. And we're happy to help you, um, you know, at any point if you have any questions. So, yeah. So this is really the strength of FME, bringing the power of all these data types in the spatial to the enterprise integration. So if you're, um, you know, building enterprise integration solutions, you really need to think about spatial data as it is becoming more and more important. Yeah, so I think we've got quite a few people in the audience today. Steph is going to run a poll just to see what everybody's experience is with FME. So that should be appearing. You can vote. Have a look to see. Awesome. Yeah, I'll leave that poll running for a couple seconds here so everyone can get their votes in. And while they're doing that, I'll mention that on behind the scenes, we have myself and Holly online to help answer all the questions that come in. So do Hi. take it. Yeah, thanks, Holly. <laughs> so yeah, definitely take advantage of that chat panel and comment in any questions you have. We'll also do Q&A with Don and Jen at the end of the webinar. But it looks like everyone has gotten their votes in. So I'm going to go ahead and close that down and share the results. Okay, so I... Yeah, so uh, really um, exciting. So um, yeah, lots of um, experienced folks out there. So thanks for tuning in and learning about all about enterprise integration and how automations can help you do that. To, and um, of course, 10% um, of people who um, are new to FME, so welcome. And um, you know, between those and the people who have no experience, that's like 20%. So please do, the one thing I uh, take away is, you know, obviously at a high level, understand what FME can do, but I would just encourage everybody, use our live chat, use our community, reach out to us. We love, um, you know, helping people. At Safe, we talk all the time about the restaurant model and the restaurant model is 
that you must have a good product and but you must also have great service and 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 those are our two strengths at, at safe so and our service you, when you actually reach out to us, we actually do get back to you, we get back to you quickly. And you're actually talking to somebody who really knows, um, you know, how to help you or will find the person to help you. So yeah, so that's great. So yeah. thank you. And I guess the other thing to mention as well, which surprises quite a few people when I've spoken to them on live chat, is that if you're interested in this and you wanna learn more about how to use FME, like all of our training is online and it's free. So you can go away and do this, work through it at your own pace. Um, yeah, and get to know and understand it for me. So, <clears throat> yeah. Yeah, so this yeah. is you, John. Yeah, so now we're gonna look at how the FME platform supports some um, integration, integration patterns. So, okay, next slide, Jen. <laughs> That was easy. Um, yeah, so um, it's it's FME server automations. We I think we added this three years ago. Maybe it's two years ago. Time just flies by. But each release of FME, we just take it to the next level. And um, with FME 2020, we really um, added this whole notion of connecting the engine. But it's the automations. Again, it's a no-code solution that really makes it easy for you to connect um, different applications across the enterprise. Yeah, so this is just an example of what an automation might look like. Um, in our demos, we are going to go um, and introduce this a little bit more um, in depth. Um, but you can see here, absolutely no code. You sort of drag and drop, just like you would in FME Desktop, different nodes to your automation. And you can chain them together depending on the processes that you need to run, run them in the right order. Um, and they always start on the left-hand side, you can see, with some kind of trigger. So the automations are always going to be watching or listening for some kind of event and then is going to run your automated process through here. Um, yeah. So there's no manual and intervention. See, sorry. Oh, I was yeah. just going to say, and you can see here a couple of patterns that we put. And um, yeah, and all the little bu bubbles are workspaces. Jen mentioned uh, and those are created on the desktop environment. So yeah. Okay, so this is the famous book that we at SAFE that um, these um, two, two guys have done an amazing job, um, Gregor Hork and Bobby Wolf, um, and just really broken down into enterprise integration and how you identify patterns. And, um, and at SAFE, um, if you want to know where we're going with automations, it's no secret. This is the book. It talks about patterns, and then we're, we're building on how to implement these patterns in a no-code um, solution um, with FME. So it, I've read the book at least twice and, um, and it's really, really, really great. So yeah, so now we're gonna get started and have a look at how we can start to build those automations, um, which you kind of labeled workspace orchestration. You're controlling the order that workspaces flow in in order to get uh, the right outputs and processes that you need. So we're going to have a, another poll here. Um, I think FME server automations we added in 2019, um, and we've mm -hmm. been showing it in webinars and on our knowledge center for a while now. So we're just wondering what everybody's experience with FME server automations is, whether they've had a chance, they've upgraded their server or installed it and been building their own, um, or whether they're completely new and haven't had a chance yet. Awesome. Yeah, I'll just give people a few more seconds here as the votes are starting to come in. Um, feel free to, if uh, you have another option that wasn't included in this list, let us know in the chat and we can take a look at that as well. But I'll close this down in like five seconds. Get the last votes in. All right, here we go. So it looks like some people have been using automations, maybe not all the time. Um, there's also quite a few people who have FME server but haven't used automations yet. So I'm not sure, maybe you could write in the chat and let us know, is this because you're on an older version of FME server and maybe doesn't have automations? Um, well, yeah, if there's any reason why you're not using it, perhaps you're old school and sticking with a publisher subscriber model, which was 
definitely not easier than automations. So, mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. And for those of you who don't use FME Server, um, in the next demo, hopefully we'll give you a preview of what FME Server looks like and sort of maybe talk through on a little bit more of an introductory level so you don't get lost. Mm -hmm. Yep, so our first demo, I'm just going to take you through introducing automations and we're going to build a really simple <clears throat> A really simple automation to get started with. Um, but before I do that and jump into the FME server uh, web interface, we'll talk about the three components that make up FME server automations. Uh, so we'll start with the triggers. Um, every automation needs to start with a trigger. So this is something that is listening for and receiving messages from uh, quite often external clients, or this can also be from within FME server. So relating this back to the enterprise integration patterns, if you're talking to other departments and they're interested in creating different enterprise applications, um, if you're talking to other professionals that don't know about FME server, if you start talking to them about triggers, there's a chance that they're not really going to necessarily know what you're talking about. Uh, so we can also think of these as consumers. So there's a couple of different types of consumers, either polling or event-driven consumers. So these are consuming messages. So we have examples of both of these in FME Service. So we have um, some polling triggers or consumers, such as email, I believe IMAP, it goes and checks an email inbox every few minutes or on a time interval that you specify. Things like directory watching, Amazon S3 bucket watching, these are all polling. And then we have some event driven triggers or consumers as well. So these will be things like um, Azure Event Grid, uh, email, SMTP, or webhook. So as soon as a message or event arrives to FME server, it will then just start processing immediately. And then once you've placed your trigger, you obviously want something to happen based on that message coming in. So this is where you will add actions. So we have internal actions, which will be colored orange, orange nodes in your automation. So these will be things that are running within FME server. So most likely you'll see this will be an FME workspace that's processing data. And we also have a logger, filter, and a merge tool. And then once the data has been processed, if you want to send that outside of FME server, you can use an external action to send that messages send that message outside. So here you can do things like send an email, which a lot of people will commonly do to email reports or email if jobs were failing for some reason. Uh, you can also make HTTP requests, um, upload data to FTP sites or Amazon S3, um, basically anything that's pushing your messages or content outside of SME. So now we've understood those, hopefully, and um, we'll take a look at the uh, what FME Server actually looks like. So you always access FME Server through your web browser. Um, and then you can sort of have a look around. Today, we're just going to be focusing on automations. So we can get to that on the left uh, menu bar panel here. And we're going to start with building our first automation. So if you're new to FME Server and you're playing with this for the first time, it does give you some hints here, um, learning, to help you along the way. And we also have more resources in our FME community. And um, because every automation needs to start with a trigger, this will always get added on the canvas here for you. So to configure that, you can double click um, and that will open up the sort of parameter editing window on the right hand side. And that will allow you to choose which trigger event you want. So you can see here, I can scroll down, we support a whole bunch of different protocols here, um, which makes integrating your enterprise applications easier. Um, most enterprise applications should be able to uh, communicate something like this, even if it's just writing a file out to a location. FME server can then go and watch for that data and then start to process it. Uh, so today, just for our simple automation, just to uh, show you how you can use this, we're going to start with this schedule which is one of the more popular trigger options in FME. 
Um, and then we can set this to repeat on interval. Perhaps we want this to run every day um, and process some data just to do some updates. So I can get this to start immediately. And then every single day, this automation will run. And then I want to add a workspace here that's going to be processing our data. So we can add an action and connect those two together. And then again, just the same as with the trigger, you can double click on there and it will let you choose which action you want to do. So I'm just going to be running a workspace here and choose one of our sample workspaces um, and press apply. So now every time that schedule fires, because it's connected to this workspace, this workspace will then run every single day. So I need to save my automation, give it a name, save it. And then what we can do as well um, is for those of you who are new to FME, you're probably wondering like, this is a workspace, what actually does a workspace look like on the inside? So whilst you author your workflows inside FME Desktop, if you want to go and have a look to see what your workspace is doing on FME Server, you can go in and view them. So just to give you an example of what a workspace looks like, this is just one of our sample ones. Um, you can see the orange nodes here, these represent the readers and writers. So this is reading data or bringing in some landmarks data that we want to process. And then these uh, green and blue nodes here, these would be the transformers. So these are actually changing and transforming the data so that we can get the output that we want at the end. So this is just doing some filtering of the landmarks data in Austin. So it's filtering out apartments, schools, shopping, airports, etc. The attribute creators are just giving those new attribute names for categories. So you can see the categories getting set depending on uh, the test filter criteria. And then we also have some styler transformers here. So because the end result is going to be written out to a KML file that you can use in Google Earth, we're just doing some styling so the apartments will look different to schools and then doing some attribute copying here too so that the KML name is right. So it's a really easy way in FME Server to have a look and see what your workspace is actually doing. Perhaps it's been a while since you published it and it's, you've forgotten and you need to go and check it. Um, so this was our first basic automation. So you can see absolutely no code. It's really easy to drag and drop and configure uh, these nodes on your canvas. So now we'll take a look at our second demo. So this is just introducing how you can start to loop in automations. So Don will show a more advanced uh, way to use looping in one of his demos shortly. Um, but right now we're just going to introduce some of the things that you can do with it. Um, and one thing to take note of uh, you do get this warning when you enable looping in automations. Um, so you can quite easily end up with infinite loops, uh, which would end up tying an engine potentially on your server or even all of them if your automation gets triggered a few times. So if we go back to our automation that we just built, um, if I wanted to say that every time this workspace fails, I just want it to start again. Um, Perhaps if it's failing due to intermittent network issues, normally trying it again, you might find that that little network blip has resolved itself and the workspace will actually run successfully. So you can enable looping inside the menu bar. Looks like I've already got it enabled, um, but you can turn it off as well there. So you can just click on any of your output ports or that, and then just click them and drag it round. And then these will get shown by a dotted line here. So you can see where the loop is going. So now every time that Austin Apartments workspace fails, FME server is going to loop it back round and resubmit it until it would come out of the success port and the automation could carry on downstream in the workflow. So because this might not be the smartest decision, um, there's a good chance in this Austin Apartments workspace it's failing because of something that I've done. Uh, constantly retrying it like that isn't going to suddenly fix my workspace and make it work. So I've built another example, which hopefully is a more useful way of using looping. 
um, so I don't need to save that automation. Um, so this example here, um, and if you are quite observant, you might notice that I don't actually have any workspaces in this automation. So you don't need to add workspace nodes to an automation if you don't need to. Um, obviously, given that we're in FME, there's a good chance your automation will have a workspace in. So what the scenario is here, um, for FME cloud instances, because they're running on cloud computers in AWS, um, if you're not on a subscription, you get charged on an hourly basis. So you can also schedule your instances to come on at certain times. So if there's a chance that you have um, sort of weekly or daily scheduled data processing that you need, you might get your instance to turn on at a certain hour of the day, run through all of the processes, and then once it's finished, you want it to shut down and pause so you're not uh, paying for a time that you're not using for data processing. So what this automation is doing is, say if I had my FME Cloud instance scheduled to turn on at 7 a.m., at some point before that hour is up, I'm just gonna be checking to see whether all of my jobs have finished processing, and if they have, it's good to shut the instance down and pause it. Um, if it isn't, I obviously don't want to pause my instance because then my jobs are gonna get cut off in the middle of being run. So I can set this up as a schedule, just like we did in the last demo. Um, and then I can set this to probably turn on every day at a certain time, maybe 45 minutes after um, my instance has started. And then what this is doing then is I've added an external action so this is making a HTTP request, um, not really outside of FME server, I'm using the FME server REST API to talk to this instance of FME Cloud. So what this is doing is just, you can put your URL in here. This is just checking to see whether there are any jobs in the queue. So with FME server, how it works is when you're running workspaces, um, these workspaces get run on engines. So if you only have three engines, you can only process three workspaces at a time. So if you submit more workspaces to get processed, they will end up in a queue. And then as soon as an engine becomes available, it will start processing the next workspace that's in the queue. So here we're checking to see whether workspaces uh, or jobs are in the queue. Um, and then if they are, um, this is going on to a message filter. So. If this is successful and the HTTP request returned a response, this is going to go to the message filter. And in here, um, we're just filtering out that message, uh, which is another pattern, a message filter pattern, just to see if the engine, if the queue count is zero. So if the queue count is zero, there are new jobs in the queue and this message will pass on to our next pattern. Um, if there are still jobs in the queue, we're just gonna keep this looping here. Um, so this is also acting as a polling consumer. So we're setting this up to constantly go and ask FME server for its queue state, and then deciding what we do with that information here. So this section here, this is just a repeat of that pattern. So once I understood how to implement this pattern to do the polling and the filtering, I can easily uh, replicate that further downstream. So this time the HTTP request is going to FME server again, but this time to see if there are any jobs running. So obviously if there are jobs running, we don't want to pause our instance in the middle of those. And we're gonna to wanna to wait until there are no jobs in the queue and no jobs being ran. So you can see more looping here. So if there are jobs being currently ran, we're gonna loop back and then start checking the queue again, just in case more items get added whilst this job is running. And then as soon as it passes all of our criteria and is successful, there's no jobs running, there's no jobs in the queue, then we can chain another HTTP request here, which would go to the FME Cloud API and then pause our instance. So here, whilst the looping uh, going on is going to be sort of polling FME server pretty frequently, and um, what we're not doing here is because there's no workspaces, we're not tying up our engines. So our engines stay available for processing the jobs and doing the data transformation and integrations that we need them to. So that's what we just talked about for here um, with the HTTP request, doing the polling and the looping. 
And again, you could also add um, another filter to check for different HTTP responses. So doing more message filtering here before you start a loop again. Because as I mentioned with the workspace, if the request is failing because it's bad on my part, maybe I've put the wrong password in or the wrong URL, constantly retrying that isn't gonna make it work. So you're probably going to want to add message filters for your looping just to make sure that it's looping because of a non-human error. So it can try again there. So Don, I believe you're going to be showing us how to, you're going to be building some automations with different workspaces soon. Um, oh. But I think before you get to that, um, we'll introduce the FME Server Automations Writer. So we first released automations in 2019, um, I believe. But very early on, we were getting feedback from people that they wanted and needed to be able to pass messages or content out of their workspaces so that they could be consumed downstream in these automated workflows. And passing those messages between uh, different patterns is really important. So we added the automations writer, which allows people to do that. So just as you would write data out to say a shapefile or an Excel file in FME, you can now add an automations writer. So on the left-hand side is what it looks like in desktop. Each of those sort of like orange blocks um, is a feature type. So each of those feature types uh, correspond to an output port, which will appear in your workspace and automations. So you can see depending on inside the workspace, some state data is getting filtered depending on its size. So anything that ends up going to the large uh, feature type inside the workspace will get passed out as a message from the large port in your automation. And then you can control which workspaces process different data depending on which port they come out of because you might want to handle those messages differently. Yeah, so Don, did you want to talk about 2020.1? Sure. Yeah. So in um, so so as Jen mentioned in 2020.0, we added the automations writer that enabled us to connect the the data that um, the FME workbench and the engine works into the automation. So now we can have information not only flow within an automation but also flow down to engines and then back out to engines. And so that was super super exciting and enabled us to take our orchestration to integration. Then we added this ability to have um, the workspace that's going to be run in the automation specified at um, runtime. And we talked about this as you know dynamic workspace execution. And I'm going to run through two demos shortly showing why you need that, um, what problems it solved in automations that realistically you couldn't do in automations in 2020.0 that now you can do in 2020.1. So this really um, takes it to the next level. You're able to do um, better support of some of the more advanced patterns. Um, you can make simpler, smaller automations and, um, and the automations can be um, extended while they're running um, very easily. And I'll, I'll show that as well, yeah. Yeah, yeah. so now you're gonna take it, our demos to the next level. So yeah, so I think I should be made the- um, Presenter? The, the, the presenter now, yeah, and um, show my screen. So hopefully you can see that. Yeah, that work. That's okay, right. perfect. Yeah, so now we're going to take it, you know, to the next level. Jen showed um, orchestration, which was automations being able to control how your workspaces are run, and with looping, you know, you can now take it to a level where um, it depends on the results from. Um, she sure had a great example with the HTTP caller there, an example of, of how you can do that. Now we're going to look at how, by connecting the engine to the automations, we can do um, enterprise um, integration. So, so yeah, so here we go. So the first one um, is, um, the scenario is an invoice. So we're processing an invoice um, that has a bunch of um, row items. And the idea is here is, each of the row items can be processed individually. And so an invoice message, is, a message um, identifying an invoice is gonna come up and we're gonna split them out by item 
and um, be able to process each item um, individually in parallel because each row item is not dependent in any way on others. And this is a pattern that will happen over and over again. Invoice is just a classic one that, that we can all that we're all familiar with. So that's the, the reason we've um, we've shown this one. And um, yeah. And so there's a number of patterns here. The first pattern that we're going to use to solve this is called the splitter pattern. And that's really simple. That's when a, a composite or a message that's composed of different um, items, in this case, is they're, they're um, lines on an invoice. And we want to split it up um, to process each of those line items separately. So in this case, you know, we have different manufacturers. Um, as we sell, um, we get an invoice of many items. We'd also want to you know, talk to the web service of the particular manufacturer and order new inventory as well as process internally. So that, but anyway, the pattern is that, and the key is that these items can be processed um, in parallel. And the other pattern that we use here is one of the more common patterns, and this is simply the enricher pattern. And in this case, a message comes in, um, it could be an ID or some value, and in order to process it downstream, we need to add information to it. And this is where we use um, the FME automation server automation writer inside a workspace to pass information in. It does a lookup, um, attaches information to the message, and then uses the automation writer to, um, to push it on. And um, so that's probably the most common pattern that uh, people use out there so yeah and um and to do to do this i'm going to use this dynamic workspace capability um and you'll see it in but just to sort of show you how this kind of works basically what this does is um on the dynamic workspace you can see we um the workspace to run is specified at runtime and um and the key thing is that the workspace interface must be identical identif identical for all workspaces on the input and the output, because we're using one as a template. And so, but then we're able to run any one, any workspace we want, but the criteria is of course, the workspaces have to have the same input parameters and the same output parameters in order for the messages to be passed um, properly. But you'll see that um, in a minute. Okay, so here it is. Um, and we're gonna use, so I'm gonna, um, Go over here. And first, I'll show the uh, the automation. So, okay. and whoa, my screen just went. What happened there? My screen just it just logged me out. Okay, hopefully I'm still I'm still here. My screen just went blank, which is a bit troubling. You're still okay. there. But perfect. That's good news. And um, oh wait, sorry, Don. Are you trying to show? Um, you're showing the slides right I'm now. Just, there we go. You see my screen now? Yep, you do. Perfect. So, so the first automation is um, this one here, and you can see I'm using a directory watch. I go to a uh, workspace called Decode Invoice, and the Decode Invoice is very simple. It's um, an invoice. I'll show you an example of an invoice here. Go and um, CSV, and um, here's the example of the invoice that comes in. I have a number of systems that can bring them in. So one system wants to dump me this information in CSV. So you can see there's a code, an item, a manufacturer, a price, and the number ordered. Um, other systems want to do it in CS in JSON. So there it is, the same information there. And of course, everybody's favorite. Um, XML, there it is there. And so I wrote a workspace that could handle um, all three of those formats um, with FME, the desktop. So there it is there, really simple. I read the whole file in um, here. I don't know what it is. So I say, hey, let's see if it's valid XML. If it is, then I just fragment it. If it's not, I say, hey, let's see if it's JSON. Um, if it is, I use the JSON fragmenter to do that. And hey, if it's not JSON, then we're going to try the CSV reader, and um, and then um, we do that. So that's the um, the first workspace. And so if we go back to the automations here, you can see that is the decode item invoice. So I've decoded the um, invoice. 
The next thing to note is that um, when this is run because I have fragments, what that effectively does is for each item in the invoice, um, they're going to come out. So um, this workspace is going to write the same number of messages out that is in the invoice. So feature reader, of course, is using CSV. So again, each row in the file is going to be a separate item. And, um, and that's the way um, that works. The next one is I, I process the item. So I'll look at that here. And very simple. I'm keeping my workspace as simple because really this is more about the automations. But I process it. And, um, and then I update an orders in a Postgres. Basically, just I'm logging all the orders I've done for the day um, in my business. Um, and now I want to um, use the dynamic workspace here. But first, I have to get a workspace. And I don't have a workspace name. I only have a, um, a manufacturer. So again, I wrote a very simple workspace here that does the content enricher. I have a simple database joiner, which basically does a lookup um, of the manufacturer, um, joins on the manufacturer. And the field that comes out is the name of the workspace. And then I simply um, write out. So you can see the output message here has workspace on it, whereas before it didn't. And, um, and now it does. And then the dynamic workspace is really the smarts of the whole thing. And it simply, you see the workspace name comes from, so if I click here and I go to work, the manufacturer info, you can see now that I have the name of the workspace in here. So I simply grab that name of that workspace and pass that down, um, grab that. And now this effectively um, can run that workspace. And the reason is, is I, like, why am I using dynamic? Well, if I'm in an uh, organization, um, like let's say I'm a Home Depot or something, I'm going to have thousands of manufacturers and I can't have a workspace in which I, um, I, I run, you know, many, many different um, um, workspaces. If, without the dynamic, I would have to have a workspace here for each and every single uh, manufacturer. So, for example, here's my workspace for, you know, again a sample one for Apple. Well, that's great, but um, when I run, when I actually run this, so we'll start this guy here, okay, and um, I'll drag and drop in an interface, and you're going to see that I have ones for Hasbro and Mattel and and all this, and I can start it, and um, and now over here is a resource. So this is starting. And um, I'm going to drag and drop a file over there. This is my invoice file. Okay, over here. And I'm going to simply drag and drop it. So we'll use the, doesn't matter which one I use, drag it over there. And now when I go over to my jobs, we're going to see that, um, give it a second, I'm polling every 10 seconds. There you go. You can see I decoded the invoice, and now the invoices are coming through. That's the first get workspace. And um, on the queued side, you're going to see all these workspaces that are ready. There's the Apple um, one that's going, and you can see that they're all going to um, to be run. And um, oops, I don't need that decode one anymore, so I can get rid of him. And again, so now here we go. Come on. That's queued, completed. You can see on the, okay, things take longer than you think when you're, okay. So the running one now is the process invoice item. Okay, well, I'm not gonna let this run. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna start some dynamic engines here, um, add more engines. We have this new thing in FME Server 2021 called dynamic engines where you don't actually pay for engines, but you pay for engine time. So now when I do that, you can see I have everything running much, much quicker. And that's the other thing to note about this automations that we're showing over here is that there's inherent parallelism going on without you even thinking about it. As I write out these different invoices, if I have multiple engines, I can do them in, in parallel. So now if I go over here to complete it, you're going to see that the Apple, the Mattel, the Samsung, the Hasbro, 
all those different um, workspaces have been run. And um, the only other part that's really key about this is, if I go over here to grab the file, is the lookup that does the mapping from the workspace name to the, um, the actual um, enterprise um, manufacturer name. So if I, I have this little table here, we'll open this in the edit as well. And this is the table that I'm using as the lookup. Now this could be in a database, this could be anything with FME, but you can see that um, when I add a new manufacturer, I simply have this little works, this little table here, and um, the workspace that I drop in, uh, publish the server, and um, and that's that's it. So that's the uh, the first one. Very very simple. Okay, so now I'll go over there. Okay, and you can see the key of the dynamic workspace was this ability to have the workspace picked at runtime. I didn't actually have to um, code at all. And so the second demo is um, one of the more advanced one. This is called Process Mo uh, Manager. I almost said Process Monitor, would I put money in a jar. And um, and the idea here is you have a again you have a composite message or you have um, different processing steps. It must be done in sequence, but the process that's done depends on either the data or the output of a previous step or as specified um, by the input message. But the key here is they have to be run sequentially. They can't be run in parallel. And so this is what this one looks like. Um, again, very, very simple. And so we will, we will go there and um, it's right here. And this one is, okay, the command parser. So let's have a look at my workspaces, get rid of this one here. And, um, and this one again is very, very simple. This is, and I'll open the message, but this one, all this one's doing is um, I enter a JSON message. I rip the first um, uh, operation to be done off of it, process it and get the next one. So if I go to file here, and I grab the process manager. Here we go for a little deal. Open this with VB edit. You're going to see that you can see the different um, operations that are going to be done. In this one, um, I, I hard coded in the workspaces just, just to be different. And, um, and then there is a message in the workspace that's going to be done. And the idea is, is that that first workspace grabs the first one, um, does it, and then each subsequent one in the loop pulls one off and then passes it downstream. So, so this is this one. The, um, so this is this, the command parser. He first grabs a JSON, breaks it up, and then passes it down again through the automation writer. That's always the key, passes the start value. Um, the task, the rest of the JSON, and then the city, okay? And then he goes into the process manager, and this is the guy who's um, smart. He's going to grab the next one, identify the next task, and pass it down. So if I look at the process manager, here's this guy. Again, he's very simple, similar to the first command parser. He simply breaks up, again, using FME and JSON flatteners, not a very complex workspace and then passes down the next task that's to be done and the remainder. And, um, and then the automation will use it, the dynamic workspace because one of the things in the next task is the workspace to be run there. Okay. And now with the dynamic workspace, again, it's the same thing. I pick the workspace from the next task, just like before. Um, I grab the task JSON values from that are passed down, okay? And they came from this command, this command parser, parser here. So they came from, okay, let's show that just for sake of it. Next task, um, task JSON, right? Um, current value was, um, yeah, next task, current value, and string was, you know, next task, String, yeah, 
and uh, like that. And so we did that. And now we have looping that comes out of the task JSON because if there is another task to be done, we basically send it all the way back into the process manager. And, um, and the process manager is the guy who basically then just takes the task JSON, rips it apart, and then goes down. And then when they're all done, it's out to complete. So this one again, um, I'll start it and um, I'll stop this other one that's running. Okay, so I'll go to automations, automations here, manage. And um, this one here is the one I already finished. So I will stop it. Okay, this other one, automations, manage. Okay, he's running. Okay, so he's running. So now I'm gonna drag and drop a file in there. This will be this, um, this, this, autom this other automation one. Okay, and go there, and go resources here, and I'm going to, oh, I've already done him, so I'm going to remove him, and then drag him in again. Okay, finder, okay, grab, we'll do a deal with him, and then drop him, drop him in here, and then under jobs, we will start to see that okay completed okay we'll start to see these jobs being run okay there's the there's you can see the command parser there process manager the first we do the detox process manager and in this case they all have to run in in sequence so we can see the hair replacement there and um and so on and so then you can basically these are all done in sequence because um, in that um, JSON that we passed in it did specify the order that things had to be done and if you think of people at a spa they are um, doing things in um, in a particular order so that's um, that's the next one so you can see um, not too terribly difficult to pull off these patterns um, the big thing was in this one because this workspace is taking in more than one works it has two inputs it has an input from the command parser and an input from the dynamic workspace we had to the the complex part is we need to set up user keys that um, identify where the um, what output to use and so so i set up task json current value there and on the command parser i set up um, current value and task JSON there because the process manager for input it uses the user task JSON and the user current value and so that's a way you can bring multiple workspaces that might be outputting different main parameters to together and so yeah so that is um that one okay and um and that's really it this was just describing the important details so when you get this later you'll be able to understand what exactly um, we're doing. And it's anytime you have two upstream workspaces going to a downstream guy, you, um, you then use these um, custom parameters, user, par user parameters to, uh, to tie them together, user keys. So yeah, so that is, um, you know, really quickly this morning, we only had an hour talking about these enterprise, enterprise integration patterns. Um, and they really build, do build the foundation of connecting an enterprise together. With the nice thing about FME is it's um, a no code option. So you do not have to write code. You obviously you have to understand the, um, the data and the what the applications are passing around, but you never have to open and write code. And this is really great for a lot of reasons. Um, one, you can show the experts who may not be coders on what's going on, and then you can have a really great, uh, great discussion. Um, trying to get a, somebody who doesn't code to understand code is really difficult. Um, also, it's easy to, you know, visually you can see what's going on, and um, and you know, it's more as spatial data becomes more and more important. It's really um, important that we select a, that you select a tool that supports a wide range of of formats and applications, including including spatial data. We're seeing lots of large organizations starting to embrace spatial, new cloud-based databases and others that are starting to include spatial. And so spatial is only becoming more important um, 
um, to the enterprise. So when you compare FME, the FME platform with um, other um, enterprise integration patterns, we truly believe that you have unmatched ROI when you start return on investment when you look at FME first, spatials included. Um, and when we mean space, talk about spatial, we don't just mean lat long, we mean any kind of spatial data that you're gonna come across. Um, you know, this enables you to save the most valuable thing that you have, and that's the valuable time of your, your highly skilled um, users or um, employees, your team members. And so that's really, really key. Um, um, as far as future proof, um, FME, we have an annual maintenance. We also have um, subscriptions. And if you get that, you're all, as things change, as new data types, new types of spatial, spatial update, web services change, you're able to embrace those um, and you just get them. We don't charge by connectors or by formats or by systems. We recognize that you um, probably use a few and so why should you pay for other ones? And also as you use FME more and more to bring in more and more systems, you're gonna need larger FME deployments and, and that's the way that we believe um, it should work. You shouldn't be paid for the number you connect to, but you're gonna buy the amount of work that you're actually being done. And so, yeah, and our support is um, both with our live chat and our, our experts at SAFE, um, whether you read them a live chat or through email or some other mechanism, and our community is just um, second to none. You're gonna find a really passionate group of people who are helping, willing to help, and, um, and we really, we really um, enjoy it, so. And licensing, um, many, many options. You can purchase perpetual licenses that are traditional for organizations that like that. Or we have subscriptions and subscriptions are, you know, the ultimate in flexibility and easy growth path and, and um, lots of, you know, options there too. And of course, we have um, the cloud deployment, which is what Jen is now um, overseeing from the support side, which is a hosted solution of the FME um, server running on AWS in, you know, various re, um, regions depending on where you are. Yeah. So yeah. So um, over time a little bit, but um, so we appreciate you staying on. Um, yeah. So if you want to try FME, our whole uh, belief is that try it. You know, we'll help you find solutions. Um, we don't want you to buy it um, until you actually have a, a solution. So proof of concept pilots learning, just play around with it. Um, 60 day trial of FME server, or you know, you, we can give you cloud credits as well for um, FME um, cloud. So. John, okay. before you wrap up, I do have a couple of QA questions. I know we're over time, but um, it seems like we still have a few attendees sticking on. So if anybody does want to stick around, we have some really good QA questions I thought I'd raise with you. Perfect. Cool. So um, one of the questions we got asked was uh, for the looping, um, how uh, should people defend against uh, running into an endless loop scenario? Right. Yeah. So um, there's a couple of, of, of answers here. Um, the, fir the, the first one is it, it, the way Jen did it is you could have a workspace in the middle that had a counter um, that to a database, and then you could have that to break the loop. If you know, if um, in Jen's solution, maybe if after an hour you're going to say, "Oh, okay, we're going to break it." Um, so that's so, so that's the first thing coming in the future of um, of FME. We are going to have this. No, we're going to have guaranteed delivery or guaranteed execution where you'd be able to specify how often you, you, you want to do that and what's the maximum amount of time and, and things like that. But you do have to be, you do have to be careful because it would be, um, you know, and you, you will know when you're debugging if you, if you have a bug in one of your workspaces and it's not doing the same thing. So there's no way that we can guarantee totally. So you have, part of it is on the, the author of the workspace, but um, it's really easy to stop an automation if you see um, something like that um, going on, yeah. Cool, thank you. And then just one more about performance on FME server when you're using automations like this. Mm -hmm. Is there anything that so, they should be concerned about or what should keep an eye on? 
Um, no, I mean, the automations are pretty, pretty lean and mean. And so most of the work, like in the ones I did, almost all the work was being done on the engine. So the server really is just at the server level, it's passing messages um, between these building blocks that are um, the FME, the FME um, engines. And so, um, and also you can add, more, you know, more, more cores or, um, you know, in break have replicated components of FME server if you you have things like that but um, you know the, we're seeing great performance we have some users who have many many um, automations that are running you know simultaneously and and um, yeah not really any really any concern yeah I think as well if the user um, was using FME server before and perhaps they had were using publication subscriptions and the notification service there shouldn't really be any difference between them doing that and using automations in terms of performance, because under the hood, it'll be the same um, processes running them. Yes. Yeah. 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 Um, yeah, I had one more okay. question that I noticed in the chat. Sorry, Holly, in case you were gonna okay. bring it up. Um, was one asking if patterns are used mostly by large organizations. Um, and to this, I was kind of thinking that patterns can be used by anyone. Um, it doesn't doesn't matter what size your organization is, because patterns are more about sort of like finding a common way to talk about how you can build your solutions for these enterprise integrations. So anybody can be using them. Yeah, and some of them are really simple that are going to be used everywhere, like the you know like the content enricher. So um, you know, so yeah, so the patterns is really um, they're, you know, they're really many of the patterns are really, really easy to understand. Like they're like content and richer, you know, um, the splitter, things like that. Really, really easy to understand. And so, what we're doing is we're showing you, okay, you have the content richer. Here's how you build it um, in FME Server. And it, and in in every case, of those patterns is a combination of a small workspace um, with the power of automations. Because with content richer. You don't know what system you could be going to any of your hundreds and hundreds of systems to get that the, the, the information to enrich that message. And the beauty of FME is you can do both of those things um, in a no code environment, leaving the message that's going in um, and enriching the message to the, the FME engine, which then just pushes it back out to the to the automation. And, and as Jen says, we have customers with you know as little as one FME server engine all the way up to, with customers with hundreds of um, FME server engines. And so um, this whole patterns concept is applicable to um, everyone. Awesome. Well, what do you yeah. guys think? Um, were there any other questions or? No, I think that's, that's it for me. Perfect. Okay. Yeah. Well, then I'll mention that if we didn't get to your question or if you find you have questions after the fact, as Don mentioned earlier, we have live chat, which you can reach us on safe.com. You can also uh, post in the community, although not, actually not that's, being, right, that's being <laughs> revamped. So, um, yeah, I think from Friday, um, you've got two days to think of your questions and then when the new FME community launches, um, you can go in there, check it out, and ask your questions in there as well. Nice. Mm -hmm. Perfect. Okay, so live chat in the meantime at safe.com. But, yeah, great work, you guys. I will close this down, and I'll leave it running for just a couple more minutes in case anyone has some last questions. Perfect. And just want to thank everybody for, for you know, spending some time with us today. We know we're, everybody's busy. It's the summer. There's beautiful weather out there, and um, and um, we hope everybody is doing well. And uh, just want to thank you again. And please do reach out to us for any questions at all. This webinar obviously was super high level, trying to give you an idea, and um, we can drill down as deep as as um, as you want um, via live chat. Yeah. Awesome. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks.